This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and I've been sitting in this chair waiting for this moment so we could be together. And today I'm going to continue talking to you about how to heal the sick. And I want you to get my brand new series by that title, How to Heal the Sick. It's five parts. It comes in multiple formats with a wonderful study guide so you can read all these Greek words and all these points that I've been sharing in these programs while you see or while you hear the series. And this week we're also offering you two books. One is called Bodily Healing and the Atonement. I cannot begin to tell you how greatly this book impacted my life. It really settled the question for me, did Jesus pay for sicknesses and diseases on the cross in addition to sin? And the answer is yes. And this book really helped me, and I know it will help you too. And we're also offering you a book by Pastor Bob Yandian, which is called The Grace of Healing, Revealing God's Heart to Heal. You will love this book. But you can order all these things by going online or by giving us a call. And when you reach out to us, please, please let us know how to pray for you. We're waiting for the phone to ring now. I really mean that. Or we're waiting for your email to show up in our inbox. And as soon as we see that email or your phone rings, we're going to hear what is your need. Whatever it is that's on your heart, we're going to pray and Jesus is going to respond. If you don't have anybody else to pray with you, well, here we are. We're waiting and we want to pray with you. But I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Hey, reach for your Bible. We always use the Bible in this program and open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. And as you turn there, I want you to say out loud with me. Come on, say it with me right now. Today, I'm going to get something brand new from the Word of God. I'm believing that for me and I'm believing that for you. But let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, where the Bible says, Jesus Christ, the same. We could just stop right there and teach a whole program. Jesus Christ, the same. Aren't you glad Jesus is always the same? And this verse says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means if he was a healing Jesus, he is still a healing Jesus. If he was in the healing business, he is still in the healing business, and he will continue to be in the healing business. And today we're going to see additional insights about healing, and we're going to turn to Mark chapter 5. So very quickly, go to Mark chapter 5, and today we're going to begin in verse 21. And the Bible says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him. Verse 22. And behold. By the way, this word behold means and wow. It's really the injection of Mark's own sentiment as he's telling this story. He's still amazed by this event. So now he says, wow, isn't it amazing? Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue. This was quite shocking that a ruler of the synagogue would come to Jesus. But it's amazing what people will do when they get desperate. And this man was desperate. And when he came to Jesus, he looked like a ruler of the synagogue. He nearly looked like a minor king with wonderful regalia, beautiful clothes and servants at his side. People were stunned that a man of this stature would come to Jesus. And that's why Mark uses this word behold. And wow, isn't it just amazing? There cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. The word fell is the Greek word pipto. It really means to fall or to collapse. This man literally collapsed in the presence of Jesus. And in verse 23, the Bible says, and besought him greatly saying, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. But notice at the very first of verse 23, I hope you're looking at your Bible. It says, and besought him greatly. The word besought is the Greek word parakaleo. The word parakaleo is a word of prayer. It means to pray, to beg, 
to beseech, but it's a compound of two words, the word para, which means to be alongside, and the word kaleo, which means to call out. This man not only collapsed in the presence of Jesus, but para, he's wrapping his arms around Jesus' legs. He's not going to let loose of Jesus, para, and kaleo, he's calling out to Jesus greatly, saying, and in Greek, the word saying is the word legon. It means saying and saying and saying and saying. He just kept saying it and saying it and saying it. My little daughter lies at the point of death right now. My little daughter is at the point of death. And when you read this in Greek, at the point of death is based on the Greek word eschatos, which describes the very, very end of a thing. It was used to describe the end of a journey. If you've come here, you can go no further. It was the equivalent of a saint. She is at the very end of her journey. She's at the very end of her sickness. Not much time is left. And that's why then he demanded, I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Now, it's very unlikely that Jairus had ever attended any of Jesus' meetings because really it would have been not proper for him to go to Jesus' meetings. The Jews at that time would have seen Jesus as a rebel, so as a leader of the synagogue, he would have kept a distance from Jesus. But now he is so desperate that he's throwing off what he thinks and what others think of him, and he is willing to do anything because his little daughter is about to die. And when he comes to Jesus, notice what he says, I pray thee, come now and lay your hands on her. Wait, he had heard something about Jesus doing something with his hands. Do that hand thing. Whatever it is you do with your hands, I want you to come to my little daughter and do whatever it is that you're doing with your hands. And it was legendary that Jesus was using his hands. And in fact, if you study all four Gospels over and over and over, you will read that Jesus touched, Jesus laid his hands, Jesus was using his hands all the time. And in tomorrow's program, we're going to talk about the laying on of hands and its connection to healing the sick. But here we see Jairus said, please come and do whatever it is that you do with your hands, that she may be healed and she shall live. And very interesting, the word healed is the Greek word sozo. The word sozo is the New Testament word for salvation. But in the Jewish mind, salvation was not just an eternal condition. Salvation was a complete package, which included healing. And this word sozo, which normally describes eternal salvation here, is translated healed because healing is a part of the package. And Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. He was theologically trained, and he knew that healing belonged to the people of God. He said, please, come lay your hands on my little daughter that she may be sozo, saved and healed. It's all one package, and that she may live. And the Bible says in verse 24, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Now he's on the way with Jairus. And suddenly we come to chapter 5, verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood. The word issue, the Greek word rusus, it really describes a flowing stream. This woman had a very serious problem. And as we see further in this verse, she had had this problem for 12 years. And on the basis of this word rusus, it wasn't just a little bleeding. It was a flowing stream. And this presented not just a physical problem for this woman, but a social and emotional problem for this woman. Let me read you what the book of Leviticus says about a woman who has a hemorrhage or a flow of blood. Listen to this, Leviticus 15 verse 19. And if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. So not only is she unclean, but if anyone touches her, they're going to be declared unclean. Verse 20, and everything that she lies upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sits upon shall be unclean. Verse 21, and whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. So if you sat on the couch that she sat on or on a chair that she sat on, or if you laid on the bed that she laid upon, then you also would be declared unclean. Verse 22, and whosoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash 
wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Verse 23, and if it be on her bed or in anything whereon she setteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until the evening. Verse 24, and if any man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. Verse 25, and if a woman have an issue of blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation. Now remember, this woman had had this issue of blood 12 years all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Verse 26. Every bed whereon she lieth all the days of her issue shall be under her as the bed of her separation. And whatsoever she sets upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. Verse 27. And whosoever touches those things shall be unclean. Clean. So not only is this woman sick, but she is a social outcast. She is deemed to be unclean. And because she's unclean, if she's married, and we don't know whether she was married or not, but if she is married, her husband cannot touch her. He can't even sit on the divan with her. He can't sit on the bed with her. He can't use the same dishes that she has used because if he touches anything that she has touched, then he's going to be unclean. If she has children... She can't touch them and they can't touch her. So for 12 years, this woman has lived in total isolation. She's not just suffering physically. She's suffering emotionally. This woman is dying of an emotional touch. She needs somebody to touch her and to love her, but they cannot because she is unclean. So this woman has suffered physically. She suffered emotionally. She suffered socially. But then we come to chapter 5, verse 26. And she had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When it says and had suffered, it's the Greek word pathos. The word pathos always describes mental and emotionally suffering. This woman had really suffered on every level. Many things of many physicians. The word of in Greek is the word hoopo. It means under the care, under the oversight of many physicians. And really care is the idea that the doctors had tried this and tried that and tried this and tried that. And under their oversight, she had suffered so many things that had not worked. That's why the verse goes on to say, and had spent all she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew, grew worse. And the word spent is a Greek word, which means to squander or to spend with great effort. She had spent everything that she had she used great effort using what resources she had, but had squandered it all on doctors as she was trying to get well. But this verse says she grew worse. And verse 27 says, and when she heard of Jesus. Now, it's very interesting that something in the Greek text is not translated in this verse. And it's very important. The words ta pere. And a better translation would be, and when she heard things, when she heard things revolving around Jesus, when she heard things about Jesus, when she heard things concerning Jesus. And it seems because she had lived in separation, she had never heard of Jesus. But for some reason on this day, she's on the street. And of course, as an unclean person, she would have been wearing clothes, which let everybody know she was unclean. So no one would touch her. But now a big crowd is walking down the street. She's standing back out of the way so she doesn't intentionally make anybody unclean by touching them. And as she stands there listening to the crowd as they walk by, the Greek says ta peri, she begins to hear things about somebody in the crowd named Jesus. Well, what do you suppose she heard? She probably heard somebody screaming, my eyes have been opened. She heard them in the crowd. Somebody else screaming, I can hear. Somebody else yelling, I can walk. She heard things, 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 things concerning Jesus. And just like we read in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as she heard the things concerning Jesus, faith began to rise in her heart. And as faith began to rise in her heart, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. And verse 28 says, for she said, and in Greek, it means she said and said and kept on saying and kept on saying. It's nearly like she was speaking to herself. If I can just get there, if I can 
just find a way to get to him. If I can just get to him, she kept saying and saying and saying and saying, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And guess what? Here again, we find this word sozo, which is the New Testament word for salvation, but it includes healing. My friends, your salvation is a package deal and healing is part of the package. But verse 29 says, and straightway the fountain of her blood. The word fountain, the Greek word pege, tells you how bad her problem was because it describes a spring or a rushing fountain. That's how much this woman was bleeding. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body, she knew that she was healed of that plague. And here the word healed is not the word therapeo, but the Greek word eaomai, which means to be doctored or to be cured. She had been touched by the great physician and she had been healed of that plague. You say, what is a plague? Well, the word plague is the Greek word mastigos. Now hold on because you're about to get a revelation. The word plague is really a bad translation. You say, what is a plague? Well, I'm going to tell you. This word plague, the Greek word mastigos, was borrowed from the world of torture. The word denoted the act of recurrently beating a prisoner or victim. Once a person's wounds had finally mended, the torturers brought them back to the whipping post where they were struck again and again and again. And such beatings were sporadic but constant. And although they did not usually give a serious enough a blow to kill, they kept the sufferer constantly torn up and in pain. Wow. And here it is translated as the word plague. And my friends, it really denotes one who has some kind of an affliction that doesn't kill them, but it's repetitive. It keeps striking them and striking them and striking them and striking them like this woman who had an issue of blood. It wasn't killing her. It just kept her life constantly torn up. Other examples of this would be migraine headaches. They don't kill you, but they strike you and strike you. Or how about allergies. Maybe you're finding them, bam, it strikes you again. Maybe you have a period where you're finding, here comes another episode. It strikes you and strikes you and strikes you. So technically a plague is any kind of sickness that strikes you and strikes you and strikes you. But Mark 5 30 says, and Jesus immediately knowing in himself. This word knowing is important because it is a Greek word, epigenosko, which describes professional expertise knowledge. And Jesus, expertly knowing that virtue had gone out of him, the word virtue here, the Greek word dunamis, it's dynamic, supernatural power. Jesus was so in touch with the anointing, and you can be too, that he sensed it when a flow went out of him. He knew that. He knew that. And he turned about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Verse 31, and the disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Verse 32, and he looked about to see her that had done this thing, 33, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her came, and fell down before him and told him all the truth. The reason she was fearing and trembling is because as she came through that crowd to touch Jesus, she touched all those people, and technically she made all those people People unclean. She didn't know what all those people were going to do to her. So now she comes, finally feels good, and now she's concerned they might stone her for making them all unclean. But Jesus says to her in verse 34, he said unto her daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole, go in peace and be whole of thy plague. But then Verse 35 says, while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which said, thy daughter is dead. The Greek says she's already expired. She's gone. Why troublest thou the master any further? Verse 36. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. If you read this in Greek, it seems rather abrupt. It really means stop fearing, be believing. Jesus was trying to put a halt to fear because fear is a negative factor. Stop fearing, be believing, verse 37. And he suffered no man to follow him save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, verse 38. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth a tumult with them that wept and wailed greatly, verse 39. And when he was coming, he said unto them, why make you this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleeps. 
Jesus knew that she was physically dead, but for Jesus, it's no harder to raise somebody from the dead than it is to rouse somebody from a nap. And really, Jesus was saying, hey, this is no problem for me. Death is not a challenge for me. I'm going to rouse this girl out of death, just like I would rouse somebody out of a nap, verse 40. And they laughed him to scorn. The Greek word really means they laughed, they mocked, they ridiculed him. And when he had put them all out, the Greek word ekbalo, which means to evict. Now we know why he brought Peter, James, and John. Because Jesus did not do mighty works in the presence of unbelief. And my friends, if you're trying to pray for somebody and the room is filled with unbelief, you may need to ask them to leave the room for a few moments just so you can be alone with the person that you are praying with. In this particular case, Jesus evicted everybody from the room. And that's why Peter, James, and John came. They were the bouncers and they bounced all the people out of the room. And Jesus took the father and the mother of the damsel with them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was. And took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise, verse 42, and straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. Wow. Now we find about the laying on of hands, people reaching out by faith to touch you, that you can be so sensitive to the anointing that you will sense it when the anointing flows out of you and makes contact with someone else. We've seen in this story how very important it is that you get unbelief out of the picture when you're trying to minister to somebody. All of these are very important factors that you need to consider when you are ministering to the sick. And my friends, you really can heal the sick. I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Have you desired to lay your hands on the sick and see them be healed? Have you tried to do it but felt disappointed with the results? If that describes you, then we have good news. Many years ago, Rick and Denise Renner felt the same way. So Rick dove into the gospel to discover how Jesus healed the sick. From that time on, the Renners have seen multitudes of people healed. And now Rick is sharing what they learned in this valuable series, How to Heal the Sick. In this five-part series, you'll learn the types of sicknesses Jesus healed, the methods Jesus used to heal the sick, the use of therapy in the healing ministry of Jesus. Healing belongs to anyone who believes. Healing is in your hands. If you're ready to heal the sick like Jesus did, as he commands us to do, then you need this series. It's available in digital or physical format starting at just $10. We're also offering you the books, Bodily Healing and the Atonement by Dr. T.J. McCrossan and The Grace of Healing by Bob Yandian. Both books are powerful tools to set you on a strong foundation for seeing healing in your life and in the lives of others. You can order Bodily Healing and the Atonement for only $10 and The Grace of Healing for only $13. Don't miss this special offer, the five-part series, How to Heal the Sick, and the books, Bodily Healing and the Atonement, and the Grace of Healing. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I'm standing in the big studio in our new building in Moscow. You helped us build this building. Behind me is the big fireplace. It's covered. That's really the focus of the new studio. There's going to be library shelves and so many wonderful things. And I'm going to be sitting right here teaching the Bible verse by verse, diving into the Greek New Testament to bring teaching that people can trust to the ends of the world. And when I tell you the ends of the world, I really mean that. People are reaching out to us from the farthest ends of the world saying thank you for bringing this teaching right to where we are. And my friends, you're a big part of this because you're a partner. You helped build this building and I want to say thank you to you. I've told you before, it's not about buildings. You just have to have the space so you can create programming. And in just a few weeks, my team is going to move into the second floor of this building while they continue to finish the first floor of the building. It's pretty exciting. 
but thank you so much for helping us. We really do what we say we're going to do, so here it is. And at the same time, we've been retiring the debt on the big Tulsa facility. That facility is so wonderful. And from that office in Tulsa, we are ministering to the needs of our partners. Partner ministry is not secondary to us. It is first place. We really mean it when we call people partners. And in that Tulsa facility, we're taking calls, making calls, touching lives, and strengthening people who need to be strengthened. That's God's mandate to us to strengthen those that are weak and those who need to be stronger. And we're reaching out by faith and through various means to touch people. And what a pleasure it is. It's really an honor to have partners. And that means you. Thank you for being a partner. And right now, we're paying off that Tulsa facility and a lot of it has already been paid off. That's miraculous. But it's been possible because of the grace of God the favor of God, and because of your faithful and generous giving. And I want to say thank you on behalf of me and Denise and our sons, our family, and our ministry team for the way that you've joined hands with us to help retire the debt on that building. My friends, when that building is paid off, it will suddenly release a flood of finances so we can take the teaching of the Bible even further to the ends of the earth. And that's God's call to us. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many. And that's our task, to feed many the word of God. And today I wanna to thank you for what you've done to help us build this facility and to pay off the Tulsa building. And together we can get this done. Wow, we've covered so much material today, but it's all in the series called How to Heal the Sick, which comes with a study guide. We're also offering you the wonderful book called Bodily Healing and the Atonement and Pastor Bob Yandian's book, which is called The Grace of Healing. These books will really encourage you and the series will help show you how you can heal the sick. But Father, I thank in the name of Jesus that you are in the healing business, and I declare healing to my friend right now, and I declare to you in the name of Jesus, there's healing in your hands. Use your hands, lay them on the sick, and you will see results. I declare that to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that you have been with me today. And when we come back tomorrow, we're going to see that certain signs are supposed to follow those who believe. Don't miss tomorrow. It's going to be good. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says where the word of a king is, there's power. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.